On behalf of Boulder Community Health, it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers, Paige Swells, Anna Fernandez, and Kate Kripke. Paige Swales received a master's in nursing from Wilkes University in Pennsylvania. She then received her certified nurse midwife degree from the University of Florida at Jacksonville. She's dedicated to nursing healthy nurturing healthy families and providing full scope midwifery services and sees patients at Foothills Community Midwives in Boulder and Erie. Anna Fernandez received her graduate level midwifery education at Frontier Nursing University in Hayden, Kentucky. Anna is thrilled to be able to practice her passion for midwifery and women's health, where she can provide care that has a foundation in respect, compassion, and empowerment. She sees patients at the birth center of Boulder. Also tonight, we have Kate Kripke, founding director and senior psychotherapist of the Postpartum Wellness Center of Boulder, to give a short overview of the services they provide there. So please help me give a warm welcome to tonight's speakers. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, I first just want to say thank you for allowing us to be here. And we um, are honored to be able to serve our community. And we're honored to be able to um, be here to talk about this topic tonight. Um, so the first thing that I want to go over is a brief overview of what we're going to discuss today. Um, we're going to talk about some terminology and definitions. We're going to talk about identification and um, ways to recognize some of these challenges, um, ways that we diagnose and what that diagnosis means. We're also going to talk about the clinical features, signs and symptoms of these challenges screenings, risk factors, and ways that we can support and manage um, women that are going through this. Um, another important thing that I wanted to mention is that I think it's really important that we change the narrative on this topic and that we decrease the stigma associated with some of these challenges. Um, and so hopefully tonight will help with that. So first, just talking about some definitions. Um, what is the postpartum period? Um, and it's very, the, this slide is very wordy, um, but I wanted to spell everything out. So the postpartum period is defined as the first 12 months after birth. Um, the fourth trimester is a new definition or a new classification that you'll very regularly hear uh, used now. And that really is defined as the first um, 12 weeks post-birth, um, postpartum blues. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the blues, depression, anxiety, and psychosis. So what is postpartum blues? The definition generally would be depression that is um, during the postpartum period that really only lasts maybe at the most around three weeks. Um, and this is very transient. It's very mild symptoms. Um, very different than postpartum depression. Postpartum depression usually begins and can actually, the onset can be any time in the first 12 months. Um, and it, depression and anxiety sometimes go together, sometimes they're individual, um, but it's usually during the first 12 months after birth. Um, the postpartum psychosis, this is a severe medical condition can occur any time, whether it's three days postpartum, three months postpartum, um, and then it's symptoms that usually are more severe, and we'll go into more detail on what those symptoms are. Um, but these are just a very basic overview of what these terms can mean, and then we'll go over through them, we'll go through them a little more thoroughly with each slide. Okay, so first is the baby blues, postpartum blues. Um, I think this is generally what people feel, and this is very common. Ge generally, people will feel a sense of like overwhelming, um, of feeling overwhelmed, 
feeling more tired than normal, maybe a little irritable or cranky, a little snippy, um, crying, maybe not for no reason, maybe just, again, that overwhelmed feeling like you have too much to do or you're, overwhel you know, you're overwhelmed with the, the task of daily living. Um, but these symptoms don't affect um, your ability to carry on throughout the day. Um, these, the postpartum baby blues do not require any medical treatment. These are things that do usually resolve. Um, this is a very interesting statistic, a statistic regarding baby blues. Um, and depending where you get your data from, a lot of these challenges are very underreported. And um, it is about 85% of women will experience baby blues. Um, so it is, it is important for us to bring some light to this, to know that these are, the, the, this can be a very normal situation. Not normal in the sense of we, we think it happens to everybody and, and you just deal with it, but it is very, it is very common and under-discussed and reported and talked about. And what are the risk factors for somebody to have baby blues? This is um, anyone, anyone, whether it's your first child, your third child, whether you're a gestational carrier, um, any, anybody is at risk for this. Um, but the baby blues is um, a transient challenge. It usually resolves within the first two to three weeks and it does not affect your ability to carry on with your normal daily activities. Okay, postpartum depression. This, there's so many symptoms, um, and I only listed the top 10 that I could really, that were really, have been researched, but feeling sad, crying for no reason, um, having a loss of interest or the ability to enjoy activities as you have in the past. Um, changes in appetite. Changes in appetite might mean you're, all you wanna do is sit down and eat sweet foods or you have no appetite at all. Um, so it could be one, one end of that spectrum. Sleeping issues, mainly this is people who don't wanna get out of bed or are excessively sleeping. Um, but it could be the opposite too. It could be some insomnia, but usually with the depression, you're gonna see more of sleeping too much. Loss of energy or increased fatigue. Um, this is definitely a, a very s common symptom with postpartum depression. Feeling worthless or guilty, there's a lot of blame, um, and a lot of people re will report like feeling like a bad mom. Um, that can definitely be a sign or symptom of postpartum depression. Difficulty concentrating and making decisions. This can be something as simple as like, um, I need to make a decision on what to make for dinner tonight, or it can be extreme like, I have you know, like something to do with the baby, like the baby's pediatric visit, or going to your postpartum visits, things like that. So it could be a simple thought process, like I need to get up and take a shower, or something more significant, but definitely difficulty making those decisions. Lack of interest in the baby or not wanting to bond with the baby. Um, people wanting to maybe n not be engaged, get up and walk away, those kind of, anything like that you would, um, would definitely be a symptom of postpartum depression. Um, postpartum anxiety. I separated these and it was um, when, at, when, I, when I was asked to speak about this topic, it was postpartum depression versus postpartum blues, and I felt that a large, a large portion was missing because postpartum anxiety is very prevalent, and so I wanted to add a really important slide here um, about postpartum anxiety. Sometimes these go hand in hand. Some people have anxiety and depression, sometimes just depression and sometimes just anxiety, um, but this is, the symptoms are slightly different, um, and so this is when you have like a lot of increase in physical activity, like fidgety type of ex activity, um, things that don't really correlate with what you may need to get done during the day, purposeless activity, um, worry that does not go away with any type of reassurance. This also can have scary thoughts of um, harm coming to you or your baby, um, feeling guilty, 
Again, difficulty thinking, concentrating, and making decisions. And difficulty sleeping or any sleep issues, this is gonna be more of the insomnia with the anxiety um, versus the sl excessive sleeping with depression. Panic attacks often can occur with postpartum anxiety. And a lot of, like I said, a lot of these um, symptoms do coincide with postpartum depression symptoms as well. And then, um, also something to make of note is that both postpartum depression and anxiety can actually both start during the pregnancy. So it doesn't necessarily have to be anything that starts once the baby's born. A lot of these symptoms do start during the pregnancy and sometimes they're noticed and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're worse postpartum. So it's good as soon as you recognize any of these symptoms, it would definitely be worth something to report to your provider. Depression and anxiety here. This is a really um, interesting little image that I put into the slides here. It says one in seven, and actually it's about one in five women will experience postpartum depression. And this is a very underreported challenge that many women experience, and sometimes it's not talked about, sometimes they don't share it with their provider. So it's very important that, again, this topic, I just, we, we want to decrease the stigma of this and have women and um, families feel very supported to be able to report these symptoms. That way we can um, provide the most support and the support that moms need. Um, the social media uh, statistic was very interesting for me. It said 214 moms in your favorite Facebook group um, are battling with postpartum depression. And a lot of times social media is um, falsely perfect. Um, and so Anna is gonna touch a little bit later on treatment and support groups, and sometimes that does involve social media and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it's interesting to see that many people will not talk about this topic, um, and so it's important that we um, help support each other during this time and that we provide um, cohesive help for these families. So what are some risk factors? So risk factors for postpartum depression and anxiety are very similar. Um, and I don't think one risk factor makes you um, more at risk of getting depression or anxiety except a personal history of that, of that condition. So um, a big risk factor is a first time mom. So a first time mom is definitely, or dad, is at a higher risk of getting postpartum anxiety or depression, a personal history of anxiety or depression will put you at a higher risk. Um, history of trauma and, um, or abuse in the past. This can also be related to birth. So a history of a traumatic birth experience um, can also increase your um, probability of having a de you know, postpartum depression or anxiety. Um, family history of any of these mental conditions. Um, also um, history of like having hormonal issues in the past. So if you were younger and didn't do well with birth control pills or you had significant um, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which is some mood changes around the time of your cycle during your menses, um, that could also put you at higher risk. Um, and then during the puberty stages, also having anxiety or depression during that time. Um, infertility or any fertility challenges can also increase your risk of postpartum depression or anxiety, having a prior loss. Um, and then one that I think is really important is an inadequate social support system. So someone who maybe doesn't have family around or has family around but they don't feel well supported or um, doesn't have their village here. So it's not always gonna be family, but just remember that it does take a village um, in this community and it's important to get that village together. So if somebody who you know, um, or if you feel like you don't have an adequate support system, then that is definitely something you wanna share because those, um, you know, that is an important thing for providers to know. And also like your friends and family to know, that way we can help um, talk about that and address that early on to help get you the support that you might need. Postpartum psychosis. So this is an interesting topic and it's definitely not something that's talked about very often because it is 
Um, on the more rare side, it's less common. Um, it's usually in about 0.2% um, of women will experience this, um, which means only about one or two of every 1,000 births women will have this. Um, the symptoms can be some of the same ones we see for postpartum depression or anxiety, um, like insomnia, excessive energy, agitation. But the big difference here is the hallucinations or the break in reality. So hearing voices, paranoia, things like that. Um, this is, because it's not that common, um, it's not something that should not be of a concern. When postpartum psychosis occurs, it is, even though it's not that common, when it does happen, it is absolutely a medical emergency and it does require immediate medical attention. Um, one of the things that would put you at risk is a personal and or family history of psychosis or mental um, break, like a mental breakdown or untreated bipolar disorder. Those would be some of the conditions that might put somebody at a higher risk of getting psychosis. Um, and this can really happen at any time. So it's not something that necessarily is gonna happen in the first three days following a birth. It might happen at six months, it might happen at 10 months. There's no real time frame for this. So it's important to always make sure that you're communicating with your support groups or your provider um, or your partner. Um, and this condition, like I said, even though it's not that common, it's always an emergency. Um, and it's definitely something that is um, not talked about that much. So it's good we cover that today. So I'm gonna let Anna talk about um, the treatment and support for these conditions. Um, and then we'll be able to answer questions. Boulder. Um, so like Paige said, I'm going to talk about support and treatment. And as this slide kind of emphasizes, one of the first lines of defense if you find yourself in um, one of these situations where you're feeling like you're having postpartum anxiety or depression is to chat with your care provider. Hopefully they've been, become a trusted um, individual for you over your pregnancy and you feel like you can be super honest with them. Um, these are providers that are well versed in th these um, scenarios, these situations. They have a lot of tricks up their sleeves, a lot of advice, um, and are well resourced in the community, have a lot of external resources that they can um, refer you out to as needed. So um, again, a really wonderful um, place to start for treatment. Um, I do want to back up a little bit and talk about prevention because I think there's a lot of um, things that can be done either prior to pregnancy or during pregnancy that can help during the postpartum time. Um, and um, you know, pregnancy is, is nine months for a reason. It takes us a long time to grow a baby, but also takes some time to get our brains around um, the tasks ahead of parenthood. So um, some of the things that can be done prenatally, um, again, talking to your provider, asking about um, you know, resources in the community that can help you. So, um, and, and one of the big things that you're gonna hear this woven through a lot of my conversation and some of what Paige was talking about is really building that community around you. Um, one of the things I remember as a parent, uh, as a pregnant person myself was, um, I had a really hard time getting past this idea that I was gonna have to push this baby out. And you know, it was really hard to imagine life after that because it just seemed like such a daunting, overwhelming task. Um, but then I got to that postpartum period and I thought, wow, I really didn't think too much about this and, and what this might look like. So I'm always recommending to people, really talk to your community, um, connect with other pregnant people um, who are maybe in your childbirth education class or different um, uh, weekly groups in the community and you know ask them what is um, what were your expectations prior to giving birth and what were the, the real realities after um, after you did give birth what were the most surprising things to you and that can be a way to help you really set some realistic expectations for yourself uh, in the postpartum period which I think is really fantastic um, also really connecting with your friends and family and of course your partner um, 
you know, chatting with your partner about, hey, how, you know, we're going to be a team in this. How are we going to do this together? What's our communication style going to be? What are we going to do if we find ourselves in X, Y, or Z situation? And like Paige was saying, just really building that community around you, thinking about who am I going to call if I find myself in a situation where I'm struggling postpartum? And just have that kind of list um, mentally in your head. Um, and then finding the resources that are in your community that are more professional. So for example, Kate's going to talk a little bit later about um, the postpartum wellness clinic and what they do, but um, she does have a monthly um, strategies for preventing postpartum um, virtual talk that she does right now. And I, I think that plants the seed for a lot of things that people can be thinking about as far as expectations. Um, uh, and then just knowing what groups are out there, for example, even just breastfeeding groups or mom and baby groups um, are so nice to know. And it can seem really like an e something that, oh, if I need that in postpartum period, I know I'll be able to find that. But when, you're, when you find yourself um, with postpartum depression or anxiety, it can be really challenging just to pick up the phone and make a phone call or reach out to someone. So knowing those things ahead of time can be a real um, real benefit to you. Um, so those are some of the prevention things I wanted to talk about. And then moving on toward treatment. There's so many treatments, um, and, it, and they can be really individualized. I'm just going to talk about a few of them today. Um, but um, knowing that the, you know this is not a definitive list at all. And again, some of the treatments are going to be similar to the preventions, and that is you know, gathering that community around you and really recognizing who your support people are and being able to reach out for help. Um, it, it really does take a village, as, as Paige was saying. Um, Knowing that you're not alone is a really big um, part of this. Um, again, as, as uh, Paige was saying, social media can lead people down a real dark rabbit hole real quickly if you're just seeing these snippets of people's um, favorite parts of their lives that they wanted to share with people. It can be super easy to compare yourself. Oh, it looks like that mom has her things together, and she looks like she's so happy with this new baby or you know what have you, and then you start comparing yourself and why am I struggling so hard? Everybody else can do it. But you know, being able to be out there and saying, you know what, I, I know 217 people or whatever that statistics was that Paige said um, in this group are struggling themselves and, and it, you can really find some um, reprieve in knowing that you're, not that you want other people to be going through this as well, but that you're not in this alone and that people have gotten through it. It is a temporary situation. So, um, so it is okay to not feel okay for a while. Um, and then um, I also wanted to chat about something that we call name it and tame it. So this is just a little something that can help people get through a day. If you can name what you're feeling, that can really um, make that monster of a feeling feel way tamer and feel, uh, feel small in a bright closet rather than big and scary in a dark one. Um, so this is, for example, if and it, it may take some time to be able to name it. You may not have a name for it yet, but this is when reaching out with your resources can really be helpful. So for example, um, if you have um, anxiety, something as small as walking up the stairs with your baby can be really scary. Um, you might have some of those um, fleeting thoughts that Paige mentioned um, that we call intrusive thoughts. They're these real quick flashes of terrible things that could happen to your, typically you often think about it happening to your baby, but it could be happening to yourself or someone else or another child. Um, and so knowing that there's a word for it, that other people have it, um, that, okay, hey, this is an intrusive thought, it's fleeting, it actually has a reason. So a lot of uh, you know, we think about what is the reason for an intrusive thought. We can think about, well, it is a safety mechanism. If I am taking my baby up the stairs, there there is a chance, right, that you could slip and fall, that you could trip, that you could lose your grip on the baby. Like, there's a reality to that. So you might hold on to your baby a little tighter. You might grab onto the handrail and make it up the stairs. And, and that intrusive thought is very fleeting. Sometimes those intrusive thoughts can, can become... Um, a little bit more obsessive and you can't really stop thinking about that. And, and that's when it becomes more of a problem. But if you can say, hey, um, this is an intrusive thought. I know about these things. I've heard of you. I'm going to just let you go and um, let it be OK that I had that thought and do what I can, hold my baby a little closer, grab the handrail, whatever it is that makes you feel safe. So um, 
you know, there's other things. So, for example, during a panic attack, some people literally feel like they're going to die during a panic attack. And, and if you know, okay, I know I'm just having a panic attack. Um, I, I know it feels like I'm going to die right now, but I am not going to die. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be alive in 10 minutes. I'm just going to let this pass. And if you can name it, you can tame it. So just one little strategy. Um, coming to know some triggers um, for yourself, so this will take some time to get to know if, you're, if you find yourself in this situation. Again, using the stairs an, as an example, if you find yourself a few months into this going, gosh, every time I go up the stairs, I just feel a sense of panic and this is really scary for me, um, but I know it's happened, bef you know, this keeps happening and I know that I get through it, I know I get up the stairs, I know I'm safe with my baby and I'm just gonna talk myself through it on the way up, I'm gonna say, hey, I know this is a trigger for myself. I'm going to hold on to my baby tight. I'm going to grab that rail. I'm going to walk up the stairs. I'm going to give myself some kudos when I get up there and, and just, um, uh, just you know, recognize that that is a thing for you and, and, uh, and realize that you can talk yourself through it and, and get by. Um, we talked a little bit about staying away from social media um, because it, especially if it, it is a trigger for you or if it makes you feel depleted. But there are some social medias that um, can be beneficial. So for example, um, joining a Facebook group that is specifically around postpartum depression or anxiety, that might be um, something that really helps you feel like you're part of a greater community, that you're not alone, that it is okay to be okay. And, and typically in those um, venues, people are going to be a little bit more um, real with what they are um, feeling on a day-to-day -day basis, and that can and help help take some of the weight off your own shoulders. Um, you can also join Facebook groups or you know social media that are um, a little bit more light, like a cooking Facebook group or a hiking one, or um, you know something that makes you happy, whatever that is. Um, Coming around to sleep as a treatment, this is incredibly important, and I know it's so cliche to everybody's heard, sleep when your baby sleeps, and um, yes, that is absolutely important, but maybe what's more important is finding that community around you that can help you do that. So um, a lot of times people say, I try to sleep when the baby sleeps, but I can't because all I can think about are those dishes in the kitchen, and I just, you know, I just can't rest because I'm thinking about those dishes. So if you can, you know, call on your friend's family, postpartum doula, what have you, um, and just say, hey, I am really needing some extra sleep. Can you come over and do my dishes for me so that I, once my baby sleeps, I can sleep? So really working with your partner, with your friends, your family, trying to strategize ways to get that extra sleep. It can be a huge game changer. Lack of sleep is um, just not a friend. So um, helping to make that work. Um, doing little bits of small self-care. Um, this can be just a short amount of time where you are you know, if alone without the baby, without anybody around maybe, or if you want people around, doing things like meditation or um, going for a short hike, doing some exercise, yoga, um, working in the garden, reading a book, um, journaling, um, reading the Bible. Um, Whatever it is that makes you feel um, strong and like yourself again is just such a great um, uh, way to make yourself feel more like yourself again, if that makes sense. Um, of course, um, one of the most important things, too, that you can do, we've been talking about, is um, finding those professional resources in the community. Um, people like Kate and her group that she'll talk about later. Um, there's other um, uh, providers in the community as well that are that really specialize and have studied and have worked with you know hundreds or thousands of um, people in the situation that you are in they've got lots of tricks of the trade lots of um, resources for you and are so invaluable so um, really being able to to make that step and re reaching out for those resources is so important. And then of course, um, medication is really, um, can, can be a wonderful thing as well. Um, of course, we try other things first. Sometimes th they don't work and sometimes you just need some medication to um, get you through the hardest of that time and it can be a temporary thing or it can be um, more of a longer term thing just depending on the situation. Um, and again, important to find those professionals who can, um, prescribe you those medications, can keep an eye out for side effects, can follow you, can, can help you decide when to start weaning off of them and those kind of things. But um, medication is, is definitely an option out there for people and shouldn't have any stigma around it either. 
So maybe that was the slide I was supposed to have up that whole time. Um, and then we want to talk a little bit about, about why this is important. Of course, it's so important um, because um, the quality of life of the mom or birthing person is, um, is really um, not fabulous, right? So we want to do whatever we can to help that person move through um, that period of their life as quick as possible. It also can have effects on babe that we might not think about. So we know that baby's development is really... Um, um, part of their development is interacting with their parents and on a regular basis throughout the day. So eye contact, um, facial expression, um, language, being shown objects and naming them, you know, um, if the baby can talk, um, being able to have those short conversations, those are all really important in brain development. And if someone is not feeling um, motivated, feeling like they're not able to care for their baby, not engage with their baby as much, um, then that can be detrimental to, to the little one. So really important to you know help treat the mom so that that doesn't occur. Um, it can cause you know, sleeping and feeding problems with both mom and baby. Um, and then, of course, it can cause some challenges with partners or um, in the marriage. It's not always easy for um, partners to watch their loved ones go through such an intense time of their life. And um, anyway, getting treatment for it can help to um, prevent problems in that situation. Um, speaking of partners and loved ones, um, there's probably some of you out there listening and wondering, well, what can I do if I find my partner or loved one in this situation? It's really easy to feel helpless um, when, you, when you're watching that from outside. And um, so I just wanted to, ch we wanted to chat a little bit about how you can help. So one of the biggest things is knowing the signs. I know we, um, Paige covered some of the symptoms, um, but I'll just kind of recap. So if you're seeing your partner or your loved one um, uh, having some personality changes, um, even if subtle for longer periods of time, if they're going from a calm state to a really irritable state in a really quick manner, if you're seeing some postpartum rage, which we didn't really talk about, which is a thing um, where they're showing some violent tendencies, maybe not necessarily toward you or the child or themselves, but to inanimate objects or something. Um, if you are um, hearing them talk about um, being um, feeling shame, um, having a lot of guilt, feeling immense sadness, those are all signs that your partner's probably having um, some postpartum depression or anxiety. And in that situation, you want to really be a listening ear. It's really easy as a postpartum, uh, as a person who is having postpartum depression or anxiety to feel like, isn't it obvious what, what I'm going through? It just seems so obvious to me what you know, why I feel this way or, or how I feel. And, and really to the outsider, outside of that person's head, it's not so obvious. So it's important to, you know, ask questions and really um, listen and try not to be frustrated, even though it can be hard, really hard to hear those things over and over again and uh, not see changes. But um, you really want to give support. And then um, lastly, sort of encourage um, them to seek help or reach out yourself to a, a trusted provider. Um, again, we'll bring it right back around to that it takes a village. None of this is, is done in isolation, and um, we really need to, to surround ourselves with that support. So if you, if you feel like your partner needs that support, do encourage them to reach out. So those are just um, a, kind of a, a summary of some of the things that can be helpful, and um, we can answer specific questions after Kate talks. Uh, but here is our slide with our references. So I'll pass things over to Kate. So I just wanted to just or to Paige. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to take a minute because I am so honored that the Kate Kripke is here with us today. Um, one of the other things that I just wanted to tag on to what Anna said is that um, 
following up with your healthcare provider, always knowing when to reach out is great. Um, one of the ways that our practice at Boulder Community Health, our Foothills Community Midwife Practice, um, the way our postpartum follow-up might differ than some, some other practices is all of our patients see their midwives at two weeks and at six weeks. Um, and then all of our patients do a maternal mental health screening with the Postpartum Wellness Center here in Boulder. And it is, we, I feel like we have the luckiest, we are in the luckiest place because we have that resource for our community, our families, our mamas, to have um, such an awesome facility and resource for them during this time. Um, so there's, that is standard. Obviously, um, patients with risk factors or histories, anything that might be different because everything's case by case would have additional follow-ups, but standard for our practice is two and six weeks with the midwives and then four weeks with the postpartum wellness center. Um, so leading into Kate's introduction, and I could not have done this presentation without her and her input and all of her knowledge, um, it's an honor to introduce uh, the, Kate, the Kate Kripke, um, founder of the postpartum wellness center. Kate. Wow, I mean, that's an introduction. Thank you, and we, the Postpartum Wellness Center is also um, does the same four week mental health, maternal mental health checks at the birth center and older, also with Boulder Women's Care. What's that? And prenatally, and prenatally. that's right. Um, so thanks, you guys. I'm, I'm um, always so honored when folks in this community and when BCH is, is really taking time to think about this larger, bigger picture of maternal health and maternal mental health. Um, as mentioned, I'm the founder and director of the Postpartum Wellness Center here in Boulder and one of the therapists there. Um, we are at the Postpartum Wellness Center, what we, we focus on maternal and early family mental health and we are what we consider to be a comprehensive care clinic. So we have um, a, a good handful of um, licensed uh, mental health providers who are specialty trained in early maternal mental health, perinatal mental health. Um, we have um, a amazing psychiatric nurse practitioner who's working with folks to provide medication, um, support when that's um, necessary as part of treatment. We have an acupuncturist and an infant and child sleep specialist, and a naturopathic doctor, and um, a lactation consultant. And I know this term biological, psychological, and social health was mentioned several times tonight, and I think that's one of the things that we really focus on at the, at the Postpartum Wellness Center is how do we support um, mothers and families and parents through those three areas of health and wellness, their biological health, their psychological health, and their social health, knowing that those are three areas that can be disrupted for parents during pregnancy and postpartum and really important parts of health and wellness. Um, we know that healthy parents um, are able to parent um, in a way that parents who are struggling can be challenged with, and we want those kiddos to have as healthy parents as possible. Um, and as Paige started with, we're really wanting to destigmatize these issues um, and make sure that moms and, and parents and families reach out for the help that they need. I do teach the uh, free postpartum depression prevention class once a month. That is a virtual class and um, really encourage folks to come and, and register for that class. It's, it's, as I said, virtual the first Monday of the month from 6 to 7.30. And hopefully that's a way to get more of what we're talking about tonight in the hands of families. I do believe that prevention is key as well. So we want to make sure our families are well stocked up to be healthy and well. Yeah. All right, ladies, thank you so much. It was very informative. Really appreciate it. Appreciate your time and all your expertise tonight. We do have a few questions that have come in and I expect a few more will come in as we're asking these. But um, one guest has asked, you said that postpartum psychosis is a medical emergency. When do you know you should call 911? Is there a way that someone can intervene with someone who's just, you know, having a yeah. moments of real trauma? Yeah, know? thank you for asking that, Wendy. That is a great question. Yes, I would say that if you are recognizing, if you are a support person for somebody that you feel is having a 
um, episode of postpartum psychosis, it is absolutely warranted to call 911 or get that person to the emergency department for evaluation. Um, if it's, you know, I would say postpartum psychosis is definitely an emergency, so it, I would say the emergency department. But as long as you get that person to a medical facility, whether it be in the office, we, you know, if somebody were to come into our office in um, postpartum psych psychosis episode, um, we would direct them to the emergency department. But as long as you seek out medical care immediately, I think that's an appropriate way. Postpartum psychosis is treatable, um, even though it can feel really scary um, to be going through that or have someone that you love going through that. Right. Is uh, this condition sometimes triggered by difficulty with nursing? And can a lactation consultant identify this and recommend where to get help? I'm not sure what the answer would be to the second part of that question about if a lactation consultant might recognize that. It, I guess it would depend on what a person shared with them while they were um, at a visit with a lactation consultant. Um, I, I'm sure they're pretty, um, you know, well versed if, after hearing some of those. Um, you know, if someone was to share specific instances, this is how I'm feeling. I'm having a lot of anxiety. I can't get out of bed. Those things they would certainly be able to. Um, probably recognize it. Um, and then the first part of the question was about um, can challenges with breastfeeding um, cause right. cause some of this? And I think, I don't, I don't know if cause, and maybe you guys can add into that, but I think that um, compound a problem can be um, maybe more of uh, the answer. So if you're already having some challenges, um, with postpartum depression or anxiety, and then you're also having um, uh, challenges with breastfeeding, I think that can, you know, compound sleep. Lack, you know, it can cause in, increased lack of sleep. It can cause increased frustration, increased irritability, and, and just uh, kind of exacerbate some of the symptoms. Totally agree. Yeah. That. Yes, I do. I, you know, it's not... It's not always just one specific thing, but it could be. It could mean that you don't even recognize that maybe you have some other symptoms going on. Um, but a challenge with breastfeeding, when that's what, if, if that's what you, your goal is, is, and your method of feeding is breastfeeding and you have challenges with it, I definitely think that can lead to some anxiety about the baby's weight, about your ability to um, feed your baby, about a, you know um, nourishment, all of those things. It can trigger anxiety and or depression. So that is definitely something that if you notice right away that you're having challenges with lactation and you're working with a lactation consultant, obviously it, the working with a lactation consultant is gonna help with the difficulty or the challenges with breastfeeding, um, but it's also a great time to reach out to your provider and talk about um, how you're feeling about that. You know, our, our statistics or num numbers are all over the place, but really we look at one in five or one in seven moms that's going to struggle with a postpartum mood disorder like depression or anxiety. Really what that means is that what that one in five moms, because of the shifts in hormones and how those hormones impact brain chemistry, is less resilient to stress. That's really what we're talking about. And so a stressor like a breastfeeding challenge Right? If you've got that mom that's already struggling, her brain chemistry may be a little um, less resilient, um, and then you take those external stresses, and that stress of breastfeeding can be the stressor that begins to trigger symptoms of depression or anxiety. So as Anna and Paige are both saying, I'm not sure it's the challenges themselves that cause that. It's the, the, um, the combination of those challenges with a brain chemistry that's less resilient and more vulnerable. Um, we see a lot of folks come into the postpartum wellness center um, whose symptoms of anxiety, almost always it's anxiety we see around breastfeeding challenges are really exacerbated during those challenges breastfeeding. Um, I would hope that a lactation consultant would know how to assess for depression and anxiety. Um, and so I, I guess my my answer to that second question is, um, yes. I would hope so. Yeah. Excellent. Does a mother's age have anything to do with the onset of postpartum depression? Do you find it in women of all ages? That's a good question for you. I'm not sure the answer. I, I will answer that question. I mean, we, um, 
Postpartum depression and anxiety can impact any mom of any age, for sure. Um, there is no, to my knowledge, specific um, tangible evidence that women who are older versus younger are more at risk or less at risk. Again, it's this combination often of the biological, psychological, and social stressors on a mom's body. And so if you are a mama who's having a baby later and your body is sort of absorbing more of those stressors in a different way, that can be a contributing factor. If you're a um, younger mom um, or a single mom, stressors like that, um, could also contribute to mood disorders. Um, so, you know, we really are sort of not, we're, we're looking at all the factors that involve, are involved with things like age rather than just age itself. Does that make sense? Yes. Excellent. Um, do you see more occurrences of, of postpartum depression in different parts of the country? Or is it pretty much just universal, do you know, in the United States? I think it's universal. I think different parts of the country might be talking about it more than other parts of the country, but um, uh, but it's pretty universal. And I think um, we've said this a number of times, but in my experience, we don't typically see true postpartum depression without some anxiety as well. So I think, um, I, I, I guess I'll just take a moment to, to remind folks of that. Um, postpartum depression and anxiety usually go hand in hand. I think it's pretty consistent across the board of who's at risk, not certain parts of the country, but there are more places that are talking about it and identifying it quicker. Yes, right. I agree. We're lucky to live in one of those um, areas. Um, are there, you may have covered, I think you covered some of this, but could you talk again uh, about, uh, are there any dietary things, if they, particular diet diets or dietary um, uh, habits that a woman can engage in or supplements that might prevent postpartum depression and anxiety, might lessen the opportunity for them? Yeah, I don't know that I would say there's a specific diet or a supplement that's going to help prevent it, but what I will say is during this really vulnerable time, you wanna try and be as healthy as possible, right? So you wanna put, be putting good things into your body, things that are gonna nourish your body. So, um, you know, I think eating a well-balanced diet, making sure you're getting vitamins and nutrients. Um, we do can recommend women still to take like a multivitamin and or a prenatal vitamin if you're still breastfeeding. Um, during the postpartum period. And I think, I definitely don't think any of those things are gonna prevent the postpartum depression, but it's gonna make you feel better the, the more balanced your diet is and the more well-nourished you are. So making sure that you're getting good fats and you're drinking enough water and that you're um, getting fruits and vegetables and you're well-rounded in the, in the food that you're consuming, I think are gonna be really important. Um, DHA, omega-3s, those types of things within your diet are great. Obviously, you can supplement with them. Um, there are lots of supplements like vitamin D and uh, B complex that can be really helpful for energy and for sleep and for mood. But I don't think any of those things are gonna prevent postpartum depression and or anxiety. I think it's going to help you live your best life and feel your best, which, um, and then can hopefully help, um, help you if you if you were to come across any of those challenges, when we talk about prevention, we're talking about reducing risk, right? And so all those things that you're talking about help reduce the risk of um, depletion in some areas that might cause might be a contributing factor to depression or anxiety. I talk a lot about protein in our practice. Um, I think it's really easy for new moms to be grabbing food quickly. It's hard to eat when you have a new baby. I don't quite know why that happens, but. Um, one of the things I worry about in new moms is protein um, deficiency, or maybe that's too strong of a word, but not getting enough protein. Serotonin, which is that neurotransmitter in our brain that's um, really important for mental health, we need to be ingesting building blocks um, for serotonin that come from protein. So that's one of the things that I'm often talking to moms about is, is make sure you get your protein. I do think that can help reduce the risk of um, developing some of these challenges. Protein, I think that's overlooked um, yeah. in a lot of ways. And I also wanted to just plant the seed of um, how 
there's so much discovery with the microbiome yeah. um, these yeah. days, and that could open a, a whole other discussion that I'm not an expert in yet, but I think that um, as time goes on, we're learning more and more about um, our gut microbes and how they are affecting our mental health, so maybe a, a place to do some research in or look into. Um, and also, of course, doing the things like keeping, you know, just eating uh, good whole foods, keeping the sugars to a minimum, and I know that's super challenging when you're, um, not feeling your best. So that's a place where you can ask friends and family for help to bring meals to you um, and things like that. So just a, a strategy for, for eating well while you're in, in uh, not, uh, not a great place, if that makes sense. Yeah. Sugar, sugar's sort mm -hmm. of a bad news for the brain, exactly. right? So um, just like any other condition of the human body. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Excellent. Can you explain what a doula is? Yeah. What she does or he, what they do, what they provide? Sure, um, a doula is a support person for the mom or the family or for the unit. Um, they're usually not medical providers, so they should not give any medical advice, um, but they are a, a very important and um, well needed and well, um, warranted and deserved uh, support person for moms and families, and they can be during the pregnancy, during the labor and birth, or they can be during the postpartum period. Yeah. Uh, what is the cost for the services that you have prov uh, described? Uh, what do your services cost, and do most insurance companies cover the cost if there are costs involved in the counseling and the advice and the treatments that you can offer? I, yeah, great question. I can speak to the Postpartum Wellness Center, and as Anna mentioned, there are amazing resources all around our community um, as well that will offer um, varying cost spectrums and insurance in network um, insurance. The Postpartum Wellness Center um, is both out of network and in network, so we do uh, we are in network for several insurance um, companies, including Medicaid, um, and then we are have private pay providers. We're also a um, training center for clinicians wanting to go into the field of perinatal and maternal mental health. So we have graduate and postgraduate <coughs> folks. Um, who are training with us who can provide um, low fee therapy. So we have a whole spectrum in our clinical team. Our psychiatric nurse practitioner accepts many, many insurance um, in network insurance companies uh, for payment. Our lactation consultant is in network for a couple of insurance um, companies and all of our providers will slide their scales when possible and appropriate. So um, we're really able to meet the needs of the PwC of a vast uh, spectrum of folks with all kinds of different um, financial needs and, and level of resources. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, ve very good, very good. So I'm just gonna stand off to the side here. Um, one, one more question and then that's, we've answered all the questions that have come in. So what medications are typically uh, prescribed for women with uh, this anxi anxieties and depressions, symptoms? Um, uh, well, I am not a prescriber, so I guess I want to start yeah. with that disclosure and, and turn it over to, these, to both these midwives who can prescribe. I think um, for depression and anxiety, the most common treatment for pretty standard symptoms are going to be the SSRI medications, um, which we really know through all of the incredible folks who are doing research on um, uh, using medicine to treat depression and anxiety during pregnancy and postpartum, including breastfeeding mamas, is really, are really safe medications to take. Um, what, you know, what we know is that mom's mental health is going to impact the health and wellness of a baby. So we're, we're constantly trying to, to sort of manage those risks and balance those risks. And the SSRIs are a very common medication to be treated um, for both depression and anxiety. Some of the benzodiazepines can be used for anxiety treatment as well. Um, but I want to not go too far outside of my scope and see if you ladies have anything else to add to that. Yeah. What, what was the question? Just what are the medications? What, yeah, Which what medications typically are prescribed? Yeah, I would go back to what Kate said. Definitely a, we tend to start with an SSRI, but everything is really individually assessed and determined at that moment. 
um, because we need to look at their medical history. We need to look at their background. Do they have a history of anxiety or depression? Have they ever been on a medication for something before? Did something work before? Did they have any interact, any reactions or side effects that were not ideal during, during a prior use? So really it's case by case and very individually managed. Um, but generally speaking, I would say we usually start with um, the SSRIs, and like Kate also mentioned, maybe the benzodiazepines for anxiety. Um, and yeah, and I definitely think that um, those are the medications that are used, but also it's it's a holistic approach. So it's not like somebody comes in with depression and we're just gonna throw a medication at them. We're gonna have gotten them in hopefully to some therapy, whether it's somatic therapy or um, so, so, uh, like talk therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, they're gonna have, be meeting with some sort of counselor or therapist um, in conjunction with medication usually. Medicine is definitely most successful in coordination with therapy care. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, have a, I have a bit of a bias here, which I guess I'll say, because I already started to say it, which is that, um, you know, being treated, if you're, gonna, if you're going to need and you're interested in looking into medicine, being treated and assessed by someone who's trained to understand that reproductive psychiatry piece, that piece of using medicine to treat during pregnancy and breastfeeding and postpartum is really, really helpful and important. I know our psychiatric nurse practitioner, Amber Grab, will, you know, works really closely with medical um, obedience and um, midwives to make sure that there's that good comprehensive care. But, um, you know, I think it is important to work with someone who has done their due diligence and knows the research about safety um, and usefulness of medicine um, during pregnancy and postpartum. Wonderful. Well, we have come to the end of our time. Let's see if I get right here is probably right. So um, thank you so much, Paige and Anna and Kate. We really appreciate your time and expertise tonight. And. Um, uh, a recording of tonight's lecture is available at um, bch.org backslash live stream. You'll also find a library of other lectures uh, that uh, are, are libraried there on different topics. So check that out. And um, you will receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please take a minute to fill this out. The hospital is very interested in your feedback about these lectures. And again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccination and boosters. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again, ladies, and have a good night.